Yeah. I'm excited, though. I'm excited to talk about this. This is the first new movie, and only the second movie, that we've gone in kind of blind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. We went in eyes wide shut. My eyes were open the whole time. I don't know if they took in everything, <laughs> but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to VCR, a vintage cinema rewind. We're bringing new movies to old viewers. I'm Blake. I'm Jason. And I realized that in seven episodes, we've forgotten to introduce ourselves almost every single time. Yeah, yeah. I think we the first one, we did it at the end and then tried to re-clip it in. I don't know if that Yeah, works. I clipped it in. Yeah, yeah. But okay. This is literally the second time we've introduced ourselves. So, hey, viewers. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> And we're doing something different again today. And I guess Christmas came early. I'll, I'm hoping to have this released by midday Christmas Eve, which is a little ambitious editing-wise, but I'm going to try. You can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. As I sit back and drink more wine. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes to bring old movies to new viewers, you got to dive into the new stuff. And yeah. that's what we've done today with... My first ever movie premiere. Yeah, yeah, and that's really cool. It was a great time. It's not the, obviously the best time to, because of COVID to go see a premiere, but we did it, and it was awesome. Yeah, we're talking The Matrix Resurrections out today, which is actually probably two days in the past from when you're listening this, probably. And it's got to be probably the most self-referential oh, yeah. meta film I've ever seen. Very much so. I was, I was shocked and in love with it. Yeah, same. And before I dive into this, my, my thought here, our plan for this episode is to do a two-parter here. The first part being a spoiler-free review of The Matrix Resurrections. We're going to try to keep it as spoiler free as possible talk a little bit about kind of uh this maybe the same points that we usually hit with our older movies but maybe a little bit more initial reactions to them mm. and then once we get past that we'll kind of flip the switch we'll tell you when we're going to get into the spoiler heavy conversation and we'll dive in, and I hope you stick around for that after you've gone and seen it. Yeah, you definitely want to go into this blind. It's a yes. It was a great experience, especially for people who've been waiting for so long. Like we didn't know it was coming until I guess last year, but right for the, like the fact that it happened after fifteen twenty years, twenty well, years, twenty years since the original. Yeah, yeah. So it's a really cool experience for movie lovers i agree and or just lovers <laughs> that's a great point that lovers great around point. the world rejoice yes for a really fun movie yeah and i'm not i'll tell you what i my actual thoughts are later but it has fun with itself let's put it that way <laughs> yeah all right maybe let's talk self-referential meta first a little bit and your thoughts on that yeah so Maybe break it into two parts, because I, I think I have thoughts on the self-referential versus the meta. I think there's two kind of different topics there. Yeah, they're kind of intertwined, but basically going into this, the beginning of the movie, it does a very cool little bit of fan service, I guess, for everyone who loved the previous movies it just really goes into referencing those it references the last trilogy quite heavily yeah it it does reference the last trilogy very heavily it makes fun of itself a little yeah. bit and also kind of reminds you of the impact that the original matrix had and in like a little bit of a nostalgia way, yeah. but also kind of having fun with itself a little bit. And I will say that I'm not a big fan of maybe diving a little too far into self self referential. To for comparison, I went and saw The Last Jedi a couple of years ago, and mm. I walked out of that film 
feeling like I had been punched in the gut. Like somebody had played a really sick joke on me and I didn't get that feeling walking out of this. I think the self-referential bits, for the most part, did land with me. Yeah, they did a good job of balancing. Like they weren't just making fun of it outright. It was it was the the amount of levity that they used. Like mm -hmm. it was it brought it out of like a dark place, I guess. Where right. like the the movies are centrally like, Very overall dark. overall dark. Yes, it elevated that just a little bit, kind of with how things have gone with technology in the real world or yeah. um, something like that, where uh, people have become more meta and self-referential yes. overall, and there's a lot more fun involved. This film is much lighter than any of its predecessors, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hate that. I didn't hate that. What I didn't love, though, about the self-referential parts is we see a lot of clips from the original films. Yeah. And I think there was maybe a little too much of that. Like one or two here or there can spice things up a little bit, but I think they got a little too heavy with that. I think it was balanced well, especially in certain scenes where you don't, you're not just staring at the old movie. It's right. used tastefully at certain areas. Yes. Yeah. It is clipped in well. You're not just watching 10 minutes like, of the old film. It's not just flashbacks. They used it in, as a prop. Almost. Yeah, in like a 4D kind of way, yeah. which is really neat. In, in some scenes, it works incredibly well. In others, I wish we just kept moving along with the yeah. plot. And maybe that speaks a little bit to the fact that you and I have binge-watched the series in the last month. We kind of yeah. know all of those beats where we mm -hmm. don't need them again. But if you've never seen those films or you haven't watched The Matrix in 15 years, then maybe it's a nice little refresher. Yeah. But for me, I, I didn't need it. I, I liked it. And I think they what going into the rest of the movie all of the storylines were well referenced overall mm -hmm. they brought back they continued on the same path all the same feelings and character arcs but they they changed them in a very cool way i think they did a good job with the character lines and storylines yeah i agree so let's talk who is this movie for first and foremost is this the film that super fans of the Matrix wanted. Or, yes, I'm going to start with that question. Yeah. I don't think it is. Interesting. It's because what was, what everyone wanted from the third trilogy yeah. isn't, we did, we weren't just handed it to us like 20 years later. Yeah. That would have been really cool and that's what the fans wanted. Yeah. That's not what we got. We got something different. It yeah, it's more like it's a little bit like when your favorite favorite artist reinvents themselves or pivots a little bit from the same three albums that they've put out that mm -hmm. have maybe become a little bit stale. And some of the super fans are gonna love it and be fully on board with it, and some aren't. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you where I am a little bit later. Is this a movie that the super fans needed? Yeah, I think it kind of it doesn't take itself super serious, but where it does take itself serious, it does a decent or good or potentially great job. It might take a little bit more time to really let that sink in and figure out where it lands. But yeah, if if you're a super fan and you came out of this and we heard a guy tonight who as we were leaving the theater, he said, that fucking sucked. Yeah. Like, he was upset. Yeah. But I don't think it's fair to have gone in expecting, like, the absolute... Like, they, you, you can't get the same mind-blowing feeling as watching the first movie. Yeah. And they wanted that again. It's never going to replace the first movie. It's, it's hard to even compare it to... And it feels like a very different movie. Again, it's still got the same artists there. It's still hitting the same themes, but it it approaches them in a different way. 
and that's not going to be for everyone and and some people are going to be upset about that yeah i think new like people who aren't huge fans Mm -hmm. who watched the first trilogy and enjoyed them well enough will love this movie i i hope so i hope that it can bring people into the tr- the original trilogy and even maybe the animatrix too because i want to get into that a little bit later as well because that is very much canon and they took several key short films from that and took some key features from those and add them in i really like that hmm, that's I, awesome yeah i i felt really happy that i watched the animatrix going in I wish I did. I still haven't seen it. Yeah, you and, gotta check it and out. And I haven't seen enough about the video game. I don't know if, how much it is relevant, but yeah. it is an aspect of this installment of The Matrix. Yeah, I don't think I want to say too much about the movie until mm. spoilers. And what we got right in our primer versus what we got wrong. Yeah. What I would like to say is that based on the last um like my little intro on our last podcast i said something along the lines of choices and leather and yes. um there's less leather and there's a very different view of choices there is a is, very different view of which choices which is really cool yes. because we've been they've the characters have been going through the process of encountering choice and how to think about it and they have grown so much, I think, in yeah. the way that we experience choices. They, and understanding yeah. what's a choice and what's already be, been chosen is a lot more clear in Resurrections than yeah. in the past, maybe. Again, kind of meta and self, self-referential on that mm-hmm. theme a little bit. Yeah, yeah, especially the new Morpheus. Yes, which, and we'll... We'll get to that when we get to characters. We're going to talk spoiler-free characters, and then we're going to talk spoiler characters, because there are some thoughts and feelings and some interesting decisions that were made on some of the characters that I think you and I are going to have some differing opinions on a little bit, too. And I hope we do. I hope we do. Yeah, for sure. So we talked about who it's for. Oh, yeah. I had my last question for you. Do you think that Resurrections is accessible as the first Matrix movie. That's kind of a point that we talked about on our original Matrix episode. And you haven't seen that? This is a great spot to plug that. Go check that out after you're done with this. I don't think you could just go into Resurrections without watching the others, and it's not worth it. I agree that as a super fan who also spent a lot of time in the last month researching the matrix that understanding the source material of the original three films plus the animatrix plus every other bit of supplementary material out there it definitely added to my enjoyment of certain scenes however i do think that besides the first matrix movie is the most accessible of the four in the main series after the first Matrix movie. I don't think I can really... You wouldn't get why people love the Matrix, I don't think, by watching just this one to start. And right. you wouldn't be encouraged to go watch the others, I don't think, because it's missing key elements. And I'm going to talk about that in the spoilers. Sounds good. There are key elements that are not what I guess I hoped they would be. Right. And they're kind of in line with what we talk about in every podcast we do mm-hmm. about the difference between what directors and writers and everyone was doing in the 90s and 80s and previous to the 2000s. You mean and Coke, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Copious amounts. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they had enough Coke for this one. <laughs> or they had too much of some new kind of drug. Fair enough. Yeah, so, yeah, there's certain things that are missing that they just did so well in the 80s and 90s, mm-hmm. and we've lost a little bit of that. And as you watch the the original trilogy, you kind of see that starting to degrade, and then now we jump 20 years, yeah. and it's like full, it's a full-on 2000s movie in certain areas. Yes, I agree. It is definitely 
very much 2019 when it was developed. I believe it was filmed in 2019, and it feels very much like a film from 2019. Yeah. Let's move on into when to watch slash where to watch. So where to watch right now out in theaters. If you're not feeling theaters with the whole COVID thing going on, you can check it out on HBO Max with a subscription, which unfortunately you can't get in Canada unless you have a VPN. And I wish I had a VPN sponsor to plug, but... There's one that's like no. No, don't say it. We can't. We, we can't. We can't sponsor any of these VPNs. You not gotta, yet. <laughs> but, but but later. Later, someday. If you're I, listening to this, I think I mispronounced this, it anyways. Yeah. Feel free to send us a message and get on this sponsorship. Yeah. We definitely have almost 200 views collectively across oh, all God of our. God damn. Yeah, I think we'll cross 200 We're, mark before December 31st. Yeah, there you go. So. Yeah, we'll see what happens, but All right. anyway, when to watch, I'm coming out of this fresh, so I don't know if I have a specific when to watch this. I do. It's after you watch the other three. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. But I would love, I would love for somebody to comment on this who has never seen the, any of the Matrix, to who goes into the Matrix Resurrections and then comes back to this kind of material to try to figure out what maybe happened. Yeah, yeah. I would love for you to leave a comment and let us know your thoughts on resurrections because you and I are way too far down the rabbit hole to know that feeling at this point. Wink, wink. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah that's, that would be really cool to, yeah. Whoever There's gotta be hasn't... somebody out there, right? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. True. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of harped on them in the last podcast episode, so they might not be returning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get into our characters, our main players here. Obviously, uh, Thomas Anderson is back. Mm -hmm. Also, you may know him as Neo, more famously, played Very by awesome Keanu Reeves. He's got acting chops, man. I don't care who you are. Yeah. He, he's he's even got more depth than the first three in this. Yeah, and there were certain scenes in the previous ones that I absolutely loved from him, but I think each, yeah, he's grown, mm -hmm. and overall, he did a phenomenal job in this one. Yeah, Carrie Ann Moss is back as Tiffany, or yeah. better known as Tiff. Yeah. <laughs> better was, known as Trinity. <laughs> that was that was kind of funny and cool. Again, it's like, they did a very different take on how, like, that was an amazing intro, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was. It, it, uh, it's so. We can talk about the intro. Yeah, yeah. We can talk about the intro a little bit. Yeah, like the intro was just very interesting in the way that they took it because they had to do something that no one was going to expect. Yes. And nobody ex could have expected this. Yeah. And it is going to rub pe some people the mm. wrong way to start. And only time will tell if people end up being on board with that or not. But I don't think that. Any other series other than The Matrix could pull what they did off if mm -hmm. they're going to pull it off. Yeah, yeah. I don't think any other series should even try doing what The Matrix has done with their intro. No. And I don't think there's another one that would like be given the opportunity to the, in this way. Yeah, but, but you could even bring up like the Star Wars sequel trilogy, right? That yeah. kind of did a little bit of what this yeah. movie has done. They, and, and they did it such a bad job. Yeah. Such a bad job with what they did. Yeah. Ugh. But anyway, we've talked about Neo and Trinity, or Neo and Tiff. Yeah. We've got... The analyst, played by Neil Patrick Harris, who is the therapist for Thomas Anderson, and he does a good job. He was perfectly yeah, cast yeah. in that role. He, yeah, yeah, both of his like versions of himself, mm -hmm. they were very good. And I, overall, again, he brought levity yeah. because I think anyone else would have been too serious. Yeah, and everyone when they see Barney Stinson, basically, yeah, he puts a smile on your face, but then he can also be such an evil person. Yeah. Like, he can play the evil part and throw in enough, like, quips that make you laugh. It, he it's is, great. 
He's the perfect evil bastard. He's the yeah. little evil bastard, basically, yeah. is what yeah. I would think of him as. We've also got Morpheus, and I want to spoiler-free say repurposed. Yeah. And I don't want to dig into it any further than that. If you've seen the trailers, you know that Lawrence Fishburne has not returned for these films. And there's a reason for that. What? Spoiler free. The, the Morpheus portrayed in this film yeah. is portrayed by Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. Spoiler free, Jason. What are your thoughts on Yahya's portrayal? and what they did with the character i actually loved it i very much loved it because it was not what i was expecting and they melded two different areas of thought that i had kind of going in mm -hmm. not in this character in particular and it's something i'm i guess i'm referencing from our last podcast right about kind of what i thought might happen mm -hmm. and it kind of came true so anyways yeah. Very cool character. He killed it in the role, I think. It wasn't exactly... It's not the Morpheus we expect. It's a very modern take. It is a very modern take of Morpheus. The The DNA is still very much there. I agree with you on both fronts there. I loved Yaya's portrayal, and I love the decisions that they made with the character. And mm. I thought, and it was doing something different. And this is something that we talked on the primer a little bit about Morpheus losing a bit of purpose. Yeah. And I think this, again, repurposed Morpheus in a really great way. Yeah. It, and it, I think everyone loved Morpheus in the first one. I think this kind of brought some love back to the character because... He kind of, yeah, he kind of dwindled off in the previous series. So with this new look at that character, it really, he became much more relatable yeah. and very fun and still quite purposeful. Yeah. All right. There are two characters I want to talk about before we move on. Bugs is one of the first characters we're introduced to in Resurrections, who is a freed human within the matrix and i got to say i really enjoyed her as well i, I did, really enjoyed yeah. her portrayal as well yeah it was very good she had a unique character it wasn't one that we've seen before mm -hmm. and because of the direction of the new film it's a very cool like the intro to her and everything was really cool and she carried throughout the film like very well yeah i really liked her portrayal that's jessica henwick i don't know if she's been in anything else this might be kind of a breakout role mm -hmm. for her she was in game of thrones and really as who in game of thrones namiria sand uh i do not know game of thrones as well yeah. as i should she was also in the force awakens interesting as an x-wing pilot so, okay. yeah, this is her ma first major... This is her breakout yeah, role. Yeah, I sure. guess so. Yeah, yeah. I And you know what? I could use me some more Jessica Henwick if, if that's kind of what her... What to expect. Yeah. yeah, what to expect with her. She did a fantastic job. I really like the character. And if we get more Matrix, very much looking forward to more bugs. Yeah, yeah. The last character I want to discuss, and you can stop me if you don't want to discuss this, is Smith. Yeah, uh, so... I think we I, can talk yeah, about it. Yeah, we can. So, we already know that S Smith, over his character arc in the trilogy, had grown. Yeah. He was a program who had the capability to grow and change and, like, in a central direction. He moved on past his primary purpose as a program and probably became more similar to humans. The very humans that he hated, yeah, yeah. he shares the same level of passion as. And we know in the original trilogy that he died, but yeah. 
here he is again. We have a new portrayal. Uh, it's Jonathan Groff, who was in... He was in a very famous TV... Mindhunter. So we have Mind Jonathan... Hunter, he killed it in Mindhunter. Yeah, yeah, so we have Jonathan Groff from Mindhunter, who's a very distinct person at this point, and... Very distinct face. You'll you'll remember him from Mine Hunter, or even just flipping through Netflix, and he's got a bit of a an interesting portrayal of Smith. What were your thoughts on his portrayal? I again like the self referential stuff. Yeah. was fun and it was intelligent and yeah, it was enjoyable. Mm-hmm. His new direction is, I think, it makes sense. Like, the way that they, yeah, he's still going in the same direction as a character. Yeah. He just took a few turns and grew a little bit and, like, he adapt- He adapted again. Yeah, yeah, he adapted again in a, and in just as big of a step or a bigger step. I really loved the portrayal. And, again, it's different. I'm always going to remember Hugo Weaving's yeah. Mr. Anderson. Yeah. And we don't get that here. This is a different Smith. This is yeah. a hipper Smith. Yeah. And it fits the portrayal, and it fits the times. But I'm, I do miss that a little bit. Yeah, and um, just to go back, like, Looking at characters still, the the actual look of Neo mm-hmm. is very cool because and in how it relates to Smith because Smith is like basically created himself like a gorgeous version of himself. Well, he with uh, we with, can't we can't say too much about that. I, I was yeah say okay something, all right but. with like he's got like bright blue eyes and he references like how it's sexy a very different this new look version. for Smith. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then Neo. As everyone knows, just based off the trailers and whatnot, mm-hmm. he is Keanu Reeves. Yeah, in look, <laughs> he's just Keanu Reeves. Yeah, he he kept his beard, he kept his long hair, and it makes so much sense for the character and yeah. like, as Neo. And they um they do say like, you see yourself this way now. Yeah, because it's been so long, and you're, yeah, this is who you are now. Yeah, you've changed. And just like like you, you, we couldn't have a Keanu Reeves from the '90s yeah. like, look again. I agree. What came first, Keanu Reeves demands as an actor to maintain his look, or the writing of how the character was going to be designed for this movie? <laughs> I think 100% Keanu was like, "Listen, this, <laughs> this is who I am. I'm beautiful, so we're going with this." And then they were like. We can write that in. And then they did it, and they killed it. They did kill it. I quite enjoyed it. And there's even... It's, again, self-referential. It's brought up. There's even even more meta into that, and I liked that, too. That brought a a little bit of an interesting intrigue component to it it as well. It was... It's... I guess this is a little more, like, introspective. Like, each character was more introspective, Mm -hmm. and that's through the um self referentialization. Yeah. If that's right. a word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. I don't want to talk about any other characters too much. We have some familiar figures in here that we're going to see a little bit later and we can talk about likes dislikes, but I think those are our main players that we yeah. need to talk about at this point in time. Plot, again, we're not getting into plot details at all. The only question that I want to ask you, and obviously I know the answer to this, but for the viewers, prequel, sequel, or something else? Well, it's definitely a sequel, and it is something else. All right. Yeah. We nailed two of three. That's interesting. Yeah, like, it's... Well, it's 100% a sequel. Yeah. There's no denying that. Yeah, the, we The just... story continues after 20 years, Yeah. and um, it makes sense why it did to yeah. a certain degree. Like if you go really far into it, which we haven't had the time to do, I'm sure you can find some a few holes and few questions. But overall it's very much a sequel that just In the dumpster fire of twenty nineteen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not the peak of human civilization anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> which 
I think it was cool. Like it, they had to, they couldn't just keep going back to 1999. No, they had to update it, yeah. and the updates. Yeah, the updates were good. I I had no problems with those at all. Mm-hmm. All right, let's not do any more plot right now. Let's quickly talk score. What were your thoughts on the score? That's something that I think I didn't I didn't pick up on. It wasn't anything mm-hmm. extreme. Like there wasn't anything that took me out of the movie so that means the score i think did its job in keeping the pace and keeping me in the movie yeah i don't think it it didn't stand out nothing like really blew my mind yeah it was serviceable but completely forgettable it it, again it was good backgrounds like you said it carried us through the plot points in the film and it never took me away from what was going on but there are definitely some high points of especially the first matrix movie Mm. like when the rescue of morpheus in the first matrix i love the intro when they're walking into that building and we've got that chain like dong dong there was never kind of that moment yeah it wasn't a character in the movie yeah it was not a character that's a great way to put it there was like only the only thing I noticed score wise was at the end of the movie because if you look back at the first one, Rage Against the Machine is right. like at the ending. And I think they did a good nod to that yeah. with whatever they played at the end. I don't know who it was, but it was like a um a female singer who was nailing that same vibe as you were like walking out of the theater, it was the same vibe as Rage Against the Machine. And they did a good job. I had a, th- a slight errata on my thoughts to the score. And again, this is literally like an hour from watching this is where we're at now. So a lot of stuff is going to come in and out of my brain as we're talking. But the song that was in the trailer... I don't know. Did you watch the trailer? No. Okay. I, wa- so this, I wanted to go in blind. That's Yeah, that was a good idea. Yeah. I did... I usually don't watch trailers for movies that I'm really excited about, but for this one, I thought it was a service to watch it before I saw this, so I could even comment on that, too, going in. But there's a song in the trailer that actually gets played in the film, and I loved both its use in the trailer and in the film. And that song is actually called White Rabbit, which is kind of that... Uh, Is it, like, bass-heavy... It's like the dan and I don't know how to. I'm gonna have to play it for you really quick right now. Mm-hmm. I think that the Wachowskis must have listened to that song before the first Matrix movies, and they got some inspiration from that. I mean, it's that's heavily Alice in Wonderland yeah. related, but it, it, I mean, it all ties back to Alice in Wonderland, I guess. But I loved its use in the trailer and in the film. This was on Jefferson Airplane's 1967 album. Wow. Surrealistic Pillow. I love it. I love it. I'm going to go back home and listen to that song. Yeah. I actually... Annabelle watched this with us in theaters, and she had previously, like, loved that song. She Mm. has listened to, like, a bunch of old music like that that I haven't... Like, she's introduced me to a lot. Uh And, yeah, hearing that, like, I looked over at her and I was like, yeah, like, we nice. we knew what was going on. Because, yeah, it was it was very relevant to the movie and well used. And just a good tune all around. If you haven't heard it before, White Rabbit by, who was that? Jefferson Airplane. Jefferson Airplane. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Effects and filming. I have a lot of thoughts on this. Yeah. And- good and bad. <clears throat> good and bad. Yeah. It's all it's kind of spoiler heavy but not really like it's not actual spoilers it's like I've, So do you want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So what I liked was the wide action shots like the big action pieces were all very interesting, very unique and very exciting. Yeah, they they really like up the ante for the excitement and was it always well used? I don't know, but those wide angle, yeah, that what worked. I, yeah, what I didn't like was the close up one to one fights. Yeah, and it was it was classic, like early to late two thousands, like new movie, way too quick of cuts. It was block. 
blockbuster, shaky cam, hard to discern what's happening at all whatsoever. Yeah, like, no, no elegance in like training and choreography like in yeah. the old, the old ones. Yeah, and that's that is honestly my single biggest problem with Resurrections is the some of the greatest scenes in the original Matrix are the fights. It's almost like playing chess with your bodies, basically. And we yeah. don't get that as as well. And not no. even close. Like the closest it's like we're watching checkers be played by toddlers. Like that's <laughs> yeah, it. that's a great comparison. It is not the chess that we expected and yes. love. Yes. And that really does the Matrix series a big disservice. Because the Matrix yeah. was better than that. Yeah, yeah. And it should have been. And we were that's what we were all hoping for. Yeah. There were hints of it still there, but I think it was only enough. It was almost like an afterthought, like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe we should kind of do this right, is what they were thinking. And then yeah. they're like, mm, only, only a little bit. <laughs> so I guess at this point, it's important to note that the Wachowski sisters are not together in directing this. Only, I believe, Lana Wachowski has returned to direct this and so we we might have lost some of the touch from her sister there yeah or at least their interaction or relationship that they had in the previous trilogy yeah they they probably each had values that they brought to the table and i mean we'll never know for sure but that that is the biggest knock against resurrections for me and and everything it's the one-on-one -on -one fights because you and i this is gonna be the third time in three episodes that i brought this up but like little little details yes. about the fights like when yeah. neo does the finger punch yeah yeah um like there's little things like that that i'll always remember about the matrix yeah and the fight scenes are kind of completely forgettable in this. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing stand out except for like a few things that are again just self referential. Well, yeah, it was, it's more and even not even like the fight itself. It's kind of the banter back and forth that yeah, was exciting. Yeah, but as soon as punches start getting thrown, I'm out. So there's two things I think we're missing that yeah. and monologues well-crafted yeah. monologues yeah, were, were done away with yeah. we had it in the first and second and like we lost it a bit in the third mm -hmm. and that now with the fourth in the third we lost it to the side characters yeah because they had their monologues that we didn't care about and then in this one you're right that that isn't a component to that and again, they're trying some different new stuff. Yeah, this, there's but... there's new good things added in. It's just if you're looking for the like the things that really made the Matrix stand out. Yeah, those are the fighting and the monologues. Those are not uh, not optimal, I guess. Yeah, for a and fan. and it kind of blows my mind that a movie 20 years older was able to do that better and portray that better they had to do more with less maybe i don't know i don't, I don't know, know what the difference is exactly i can't pinpoint it there's maybe, probably multiple causes but maybe it's just the the effects of time on hollywood because yeah. in 20, in 1999 during the peak of human civilization we we had this perfect mashup of genres and they hired do you remember his name that that specific choreographer from hong kong to i mean you could go back to the first episode of our matrix series here and and hear who that was but i i don't think there was as much thought put into that and i think that they decided to go with what what films have been up to for the last 20 years and that's just make fights less Recog less easy to follow and and probably overall easier to film. Yeah, I, it was Yon Wu Ping, I okay. believe, and who was the uh, choreographer previously. And yeah, I don't know if he worked on this. I don't see it directly right here, but um, yeah, like they didn't they didn't spend the time on that. No, they really didn't. 
that's all I've got for effects and filming. Do you have any other thoughts on any of that? That's that's where I landed. Happy with some parts. Very much like the lowest points of the film were the effects and filming for yeah, me, though. Yeah, I would agree. And yeah, that's about all I could say at this point. Okay, cool. So let's talk themes really quickly. Again, the power of choice and and the humanity of choice very relevant again yeah, yeah and yeah it goes a little bit farther than it has before i think yeah or in a in a meta way in meta, a very meta, meta way. and modern because yeah. i think we as a society think differently and the way that we mm -hmm. express ourselves has changed and they are very much in tune with the modern view of this I in think. 1999 our eyes were wide shut yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very much so it's not like it's it's not like they're being woke or anything, but they're it's like the 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 truer essence of what it means to be, I guess, woke. Like they're they're really looking into like the philosophy of choice at a level that's relatable. That yeah. what, you see teens joking about this on TikTok these days. Like it's they are the kids are self referential, mm -hmm. and the um the way people are looking at what it means to like make choices in the world that we live in so, yeah. yeah they did a good job there yeah i agree i don't know if this is a theme necessarily or not but this film is a very modern take on the matrix in terms of again the self-referential jokes and and what well, and the how meta it is especially at the beginning and I actually, I didn't have a problem with that again. The one thing that I did want to say that I noticed by the end is that it, it's really only the characters, for the most part, it's really only the characters that we're not necessarily supposed to like that are super meta. There's a lot of characters, especially near the beginning, that are super meta and self-referential to the Matrix original trilogy and <laughs> I, I i'm really dancing around the spoilers ladies and gents you're all welcome i don't think i can go any further than that you're welcome <laughs> very very welcome thank, thank you thank for you. coming jason thank, thank you for coming okay <laughs> um what what i think it, with within the themes that carry over from the originals um love and choice we're still there. Look, we already s spoke about choice, but the love aspect. Yeah. I, th I think, like, I didn't love it in the beginning, in the first three, like, as I was watching them, but now mm. I'm starting to respect it as, like, an essential element and an essential theme because it's not, like, the focus necessarily. It's it not is. the focus of the original trilogy necessarily, <laughs> it was... but I think, I think you're onto something here where resurrections reframed love as a very central aspect and i think it kind of makes it pop a little bit more in the first yeah. three yeah it didn't feel as forced in this one i really liked what they did with tiff's and tomas's uh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> relationship yeah and i think film has grown in that area where things are more real mm -hmm. things are more relatable they're not just like like a gorgeous on-screen couple like from the 90s or whatever where they just mm -hmm. like smash them together suddenly and like it's like sparks and stuff yeah it's very touching and loving and real and like you, you yeah you feel it we're we they've mm -hmm. grown in that area so the the theme of love carries over and still has like a central importance to like the plot lines and stuff so they continued that and they did it well completely same page with that and carrie ann moss i really hope we got a big resurgence because i missed you these last 20 years and well, your she, badassness she has been in a lot but besides that yeah yeah she's but she's been less central in a lot of what she's been in yeah yeah this was a good good character reprisal she did a great job good um yeah, we talk overall. about character reprisal she's tiff yeah well yeah <laughs> oh she is a new new character yeah in a all way. Right. <laughs> um, all right, let's let's stop talking before we get into spoiler territory. Let's talk legacy really quickly. Mm. I always say that the sign of a good movie, to me personally, is 
something that I remember in six months. And I think that I'm going to remember aspects of Resurrections in six months. Yeah, it brought a lot of new, a lot of good new things to the series. Yeah. And those are, I think, what I'll remember, like the Mm -hmm. good things. Obviously, I'll... I won't remember the fight scenes. I'm not yeah. going to remember those small details or the um, other things like that. But like the new look on choices, I yeah. like that. And I'll, I'll like that brings up a few questions that I might ponder from time to time. Yeah. Well, something else to quickly touch on, and we didn't touch on this in effects and filming, but this kind of ties to both, is the part of the legacy of the original three is the use of bullet time or what's known as bullet time now yeah. and there's a very meta take on bullet time and even a little bit of bullet time version two in this yeah. film it got an upgrade yeah and i enjoyed what they did with it but it's not going to have the same impact on cinema that the matrix did back in 1999 no yeah yeah there's it has one idea that's new to it that is very cool but it's not gonna push any boundaries or anything it's it's a cool um upgrade yeah yeah and and neo's new abilities i guess they're they're very it's just a small upgrade i guess for him in a certain area right right but yeah you're gonna have to refresh my memory that on that and spoilers because i might have already forgotten that piece (laughs) well yeah honestly yeah it's just something that makes sense that um, he should have been able to do, but he didn't previously, and now he does. That's about it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, bullet time. It was, uh, yeah, good upgrade. Yeah, otherwise, there's not nothing in this that's going to change cinema forever, or mm-hmm. anything like that. Actually, the only thing, like, the, the central thing that changes cinema forever is the fact that they were, they went so hard into the... Um, the intro, the way they yeah. did it, that's the only, like, that's, that's the, like, crowning jewel, I guess. I yeah. think that's gonna be divisive, though, and I... In a good way, well, like, divisive is good sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like it. I agree, and I enjoyed the first bit. I could very much see that cropping up in the future cinema in the next 10 years, especially because, like you said earlier, it's... It is very meta to our current culture of, yeah. of the meme culture and everything is a little bit cheeky kind of thing. Yeah, but it's smart cheeky now. It is smart cheeky. Because like we, our, our age growing up um, and the p- other people who are watching this our age, mm-hmm. we had like the superhero movie and scary movies. Yeah, we and had those, dumb humor. Yeah, we had a lot of toilet humor. But and those were very referential to whatever like those were parody, I guess. Yeah. But this was like they took the good humor from that yeah. and then twisted it into a good version of whatever it, whatever it was. I don't know I don't know what they did, but it was good. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this is, this brings up another good question. What are your thoughts on the lighter tone of resurrections compared to the original trilogy did it land for you yeah because again i think it is up to date Mm -hmm. because i think things were a little bit heavy in the 90s like things were (laughs) like like film and like everything was dark and um i don't know if it felt right that trilogy and then this edition, this new one, it feels very relevant to who we are today, I think. So yeah. the, the lightness with a hint, like, we are deeper, but we're lighter about it. I think I think things are a little dark right now, to be completely honest. Yeah. And when this was originally intended to be released, it was actually right around the time of the start of COVID. And it, like I said, it was film developed in 2019. So if you look back to 2019 and maybe what the trajectory of 2020 was pre-pandemic, this film definitely hits kind of the mood and the vibes of that era. Yeah. During, you know, post-COVID era, I think 
I like the lighter approach because it kind of takes you out of maybe some of the darkness of this current era a little bit. Yeah. See, I think when people are today like talking about COVID, obviously there's like a full undercurrent of how shitty it is. Yeah. But there's a lot of humor to keep like keep us going. And yeah. so they, they had both of they, they had that element of the undercurrent of like the deep thoughts with the levity that was required yeah. and that we we all experience. I got another question for you. How did the stakes feel in this? Were the stakes high? Did you care? Did you not care? They weren't high enough. They yeah, they it was definitely more character focused. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't existential. Yeah, it definitely was not existential at all. And that's very different from the first three. Yeah, yeah. And especially I, where we just left off in the third. Yeah. It, oh. Although although I will say in its defense that it was I think that it was utilized well for the most part. Like there were points when my palms were sweaty and mom spaghetti yeah knees weak arms were ready i i'm butchering <laughs> this <laughs> are you even a 90s kid <laughs> can you do it i could but i'm not going to okay <laughs> let's continue <laughs> let's, let's make me feel bad about yeah, this yeah. <laughs> all right all right personal reviews as spoiler free as possible and this is first take. This is like if if I bring up Eyes Wide Shut for a moment, we talked over and over during that podcast about how our opinions changed partway through the film, two hours after the film, two days later, and, and a week later. And it's probably still evolving, honestly, yeah. and ever changing. So, so my review at this point is kind of an ongoing review and I absolutely hold the right to change this, mm. especially after a rewatch. Because I think I think a rewatch tells you a lot about whether the film holds up or not. Yeah. So all that being said, I really enjoyed this. Yeah. I I loved the characters. I loved what they did with a lot of the characters. Sure, it was meta and self-referential to a fault at times. Potentially. But overall, I had a lot of fun. I was nervous at times. I didn't know where things were always going to be headed. Even though at the same time, there maybe was some plot points that have been treaded quite numerously in the past. Mm. And that's kind of my overall thoughts. Like, you've heard kind of my thoughts on each of the different kind of components to that. Again, the weakest spot for me is in the loss of the one-on-one -on -one fights. Those really well-done chore choreographed fight scenes are just yeah. not here. And the film's definitely lacking for that. But there's there's a lot to love in, in this film. Yeah. And... I'm very much on this in the, like a very similar boat. Mm -hmm. We are basically just kayaking beside each other if we're going to be in boats. Are we? Why don't we just hop in the same canoe? Let's be economical uh, here. Uh, it's COVID, man. Get it. <laughs> we can stay six feet apart. Uh, yeah, I guess. But, anyways. Um, <laughs> what a turn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How the turntables. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> Your I'm thoughts. in the same boat. I, yeah, my <laughs> thoughts. Um, I very much liked it. It was very... The, a lot of the good new stuff and enough of the old stuff that I think they mashed it well together. They mashed a lot of things together that I really liked about the old stuff and the new culture and the new ideas. Yeah. Uh, there are definitely faults, but it's a little too soon to say, like, I absolutely love this movie. I don't, I, I like a lot of it though. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably a better way to put it. What, what I would compare it to is I'm a very, I'm a big fan of the wheel of time. Yeah. And so I read all the books and now it's out on prime and it's mm -hmm. kicking ass and I'm loving watching it, but I'm still like, 
but this is different, and no, that shouldn't be like that. Right. And it's it's almost the exact same feeling with this, mm -hmm. where like I, we have had this trilogy for so long, and it's like we've we loved the trilogy, and it just brought it in into a a whole new light that it shines on the good and the bad in very different ways, and it's very worth a watch. Yeah. Uh, if you're a fan of any of the original Matrix films, you should uh, you should watch Resurrections. And if you're a fan of the current meta humor, you'll only get a kick out of this. If you're not a fan of either of those, this might not be for you. Again, it'd be interesting to hear some perspectives of people who have never seen any of the Matrix films before. And I'm sure any... Potentially, there are a few late 90s or early 2000s babies out there who haven't, and maybe this is your first experience with The Matrix. Kelvin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's kind of where I land as well. Early, 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 early thoughts. Where do you slot this in with the original Matrix trilogy? Quality level? What are you asking? Yeah, I mean, whatever whatever standards you want to put it at. Well, honestly, it's probably not the third best. I would say the it goes first, second, and then this. Yeah. Basically, the they got rid of all the campy humor that they tried in the third film. Yes. So they they definitely improved upon the humor in that respect because they were trying. It wasn't humor, I guess, in the third. It was like that whole knuckle up like they were trying too hard there yeah. there are certain areas where they definitely tried too hard in resurrections but overall yeah it's good i don't know yeah no that's fair i think i'm actually in the exact same position as you where obviously the first matrix is never going to be topped no. you're just it's, you're just treading similar ground it's just impossible i don't know how you could ever beat the first matrix movie if you're comparing it to other Matrix movies. But anyway, time will tell, and a few rewatches, because I've watched the second movie a million times, but we'll see. We'll see. This could topple the second movie in terms of where it fits on my favorites, and, and I'm going to have to get a free few rewatches in to know whether or not, or, or whether the issues that I have with Resurrections outweighs maybe some of the minor issues that i have with reloaded yeah but resurrections feels like an interesting pivot whereas reloaded feels like more of the same and so it'll be interesting to see kind of where my mind ends up there yeah you know what i just had a thought they should change the name of Reloaded to Unloaded because it wasn't that great. <laughs> no, well, it, it was it was still good, but I mean, like, it was like they just unloaded the, the gun <laughs> and then they're like, all right, that's it. Well, Reloaded is like a reference to Reloading the Matrix. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. I, that was, <laughs> I'm, I went a different way. You made a funny. Yeah, yeah. I attempted at least. Anyways. Aw. So, um... Oh, sad for Jason's fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think it's time to get into spoilers. You've waited Definitely. long enough. So, at this point in time, if you haven't seen The Matrix Resurrections and you really want to, this is a great spot to pause, come back later, and, and uh, kind of revisit some of the big moments of the film and what we liked, what we didn't like, compare and contrast with us, and also maybe what we were correct on, on the primer, and what yeah. we were wrong about, too. I'm really excited to talk a little bit about that Me as too. well. It's and even, even talk some theories, because not everything's explained, as we kind of expected with the Wachowskis. So at this point in time, again, perfectly fine turn it off. I'll give you a second for all of you people driving on the car on the way to work. Yeah. All right, yeah. let's get into it. Let's do it. So, so the intro, the yes. the intro scene was amazing for a callback. Yeah, Bugs is the yeah. first person we're introduced to. Yeah, and we see her in a new aspect. She's not necessarily the um 
the person we're expecting to be like snooping around in the matrix she's going about it in a different way she's looking at the code yeah and like she just finds a, a way in and she views trinity's original scene from the first movie from a different perspective and that yeah. was super cool i loved that yeah, I really like that too. And it was a setup as well to capture her basically. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah, the way they did it, it was it was perfect as the first scene because we they instantly threw you into that self-referential thing that we yeah. keep talking about, but it's essential to the way they went with this. this and one. not only that, the first few minutes were introduced to the new version of Morpheus yeah. who is an agent at this point he's a program so the machines designed a an agent to be like morpheus which is really neat and he is at this point oh no he's not no. designed he's designed by wait no he, he's just a regular agent yeah he's just a regular agent who's broken from his protocol yes. and remembered who he was designed it, or inspired by in his design. No, no, that's not the way I viewed it. Which okay, is, how do you it, view it? Let's, yeah, let, so, I want to hear how you viewed it that way. Okay, so we're introduced to Bugs, and she's watching the original Trinity fight scene. Right. And she's like, I remember this. Why do I remember this? They're just in a random piece of the Matrix looking at something, snooping around. Uh -huh. And then she finds this original scene. Uh -huh. And then... She gets somehow involved, and the events kind of change in this original fight scene. Right. And then she gets pulled out by an agent. Yeah, she gets saved by an agent. She's basically cornered on all sides, so we get a deus ex machina. Yes. Which also is directly referenced, and I love that. Yeah, later. yeah, yeah. All of the signs that we're seeing, like, we're seeing self-referential signs yeah. because they're playing this joke. And we'll get into that in just a minute, but yeah. So she even gets, the jokes had a purpose, yeah, which was yeah, fantastic. Yeah, but yeah. go on, go on. So, go on. so she gets pulled out of the fights by an agent, and we find out he's a rogue agent in a different way. He had an experience where he saw Neo. Yeah, and Neo. No, he saw the code. He saw the code. He saw the code and after he saw Neo. He saw Neo first. No, no, he, it was it was Bugs that saw Neo. First. I, th I think he saw him too. Uh, maybe because I thought it was the mirror, and he saw the code yeah. in the mirror. Yeah. So after, I, from what I remember of what we maybe just that was watched. his understanding of the one or something like that. I, Anyways, this is, this is our first watch yeah, through yeah. ever. It, <laughs> We're like, not gonna remember every was, point. It exactly. was three hours ago, but from yeah. what I remember is that they both saw Neo at some point, and no, maybe he didn't. Anyways. Morpheus starts to see the code. Something happens, like a little bug or something, and he he can start to see the green matrix code yeah. in mirrors and in windows. And and he starts questioning his purpose. Yeah, yeah, as a regular Smith agent. And yeah. he suddenly, he sees Neo, I think, in the code and through the mirror. Yes. And then he suddenly gets repurposed he gets he finds a new purpose yeah in that he becomes morpheus yeah and it, well he was designed he was directly inspired by morpheus as an agent and we'll see that later a lot of, of the machines are inspired heavily in their creations of programs but by what they've already what they've already created or what they've seen they draw a lot of inspiration from past kind of iterations, iterations yeah yeah and I, I i loved that idea and yeah. i thought it was u utilized very well yeah because it's not like they're gonna throw out the old code and restart they're just gonna yeah. build upon it based on what they've learned yeah which is exactly what we would expect from an ai yeah so this is the friendly agent that we get, yeah. who who turns out to be a new embodiment of Morpheus, repurposed and utilized so much better than the Morpheus of Reloaded and Revolutions. Yeah, yeah. He basically absorbs all the knowledge that the Matrix has on Morpheus and yeah. who Morpheus is. So we see the all of the scenes, all of the quotes 
the major like quotes that Morpheus did. Yeah. And he starts to um like make fun of the old version basically yeah. in this new age like 2019 humor. Yeah. Which is it was it was unreal because he's a very relatable like young Morpheus. Yeah. It was very cool to see. Yeah. So we get Thomas Anderson who's a video game designer who designed a game uh, called The Matrix, or maybe not called that necessarily. It was. It was called The Matrix? Yes. Okay. And it literally, they used footage of the films, which is reality in this world, as video game cutscenes, which is yeah. wild. Yeah. And he's basically got a bunch of handlers around him who are making sure that he sticks within his protocol, basically. And opposite to him is Smith, yeah. which is wild, yeah. which is wild. Yeah. And when Smith breaks out of his programming yes. was amazing. Oh, yeah. I love yeah. when he picked up the gun and yeah. he's like, Anderson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it all just surged into him. So yeah. basically like the, the, this area of the movie, this intro is that Neo is as it's directly after the events of the third yeah. film, and he, well, not directly after the events. Of the no, third it film. took it's a little 60 bit. Sixty years later, it is sixty years later, but he's gone through this iteration a bunch of times. Yeah. So he's stuck in a programming loop called a modal, and yes. so basically, the Matrix has turned him into a coder who he created a video game in his mind yeah where he felt like he poured everything that he was into this video game yep. but this video game was actually the whole matrix trilogy and so he's I'm tricked about to... by the machine to believe that everything that happened in the matrix trilogy yeah was just his creation of this video game I'm 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 copywriting this theory right now that the reason why they did that was to a make the events feel real to Neo to explain that part in his brain mm -hmm. but b explain it to the larger world because we had to reload the whole matrix after the events of revolutions every single human being would have had kind of that weird moment in time, right? Yeah. And and this is a great way to fix the anomalies of what's happened yeah. in revolutions. And that's even what the the program, what the analyst has done, is he's essentially using the code of Neo and Smith to basically perfect the purpose of the Matrix. And he's also stated that too. And, and even the humans in this world, in Zion, or in uh, IO, which is a play on O1, the machine okay, city. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the humans there have essentially given up yeah. on trying to free the humans because the, uh, the analyst has become so effective at yeah. keeping people hooked on the Matrix, yeah. which is beautiful. Yeah. And the way he's hooked people into the idea of the Matrix is beautiful absolutely amazing yeah so introducing the video game to this whole world within the matrix everybody knows this video game because it's the top video game mm -hmm. that's ever been produced mm -hmm. and that explains why everybody kind of remembers some of what happened yeah it intro it lets that it's gaslighting to a very intelligent level basically and it opens the door to make this world a reflection of our own as well. Yeah. Because everybody knows, and, and we literally get a guy say, everybody knows bullet time, and when they think of the Matrix, they think of Neo doing yeah, like yeah. the backwards dodge of the bullets yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Like Again, self-referential at times to a fault, but in those moments at the beginning, so unique. That is the revolution of the Matrix Resurrections, is the self-referential at the bits that no other series should even dare to attempt. No, yeah, they, they did it very well. Extremely well. Yeah. Extraordinarily and, well. Yeah, and I love the idea that I just said, the gaslighting. Yeah. Because... Neo is trying to figure out like why he's going insane 
and he feels like the video game that he produced is real. Yeah. And he's he's telling his therapist who yeah. is the analyst who is running this who's whole thing. Who's using yeah. he's using Neo's own behaviors. It's almost like a a reference to Scientology using yeah. your innermost thoughts and ideas against you. Yeah. Yeah, and he's he's done it. He's convinced Neo and he's convinced the, the rest of the people that are still stuck in the Matrix. Mm-hmm. And he's boosted the power output of all of those human batteries yeah. by using all of that, uh, the brain activity that's yeah. that's connected through this whole network of oh, yeah. lies. It was just amazing. Yeah. And to segue as well, I love the lore of what's happened in the matrix and in the real world over the 60 years that we've been absent where the machines warred against each other. And then after that, you were right. A theory or a question that you had of why, why haven't humans and machines started to cooperate with each other or like, segments of them and we see that yeah which yeah. is fantastic yeah and really and well done again yeah really well done yes the so that's again the morpheus is a program and the machines from some of the machines from machine city yeah when against the rest of the machines and join the humans and and, and by choice as by well. choice again and, choices yeah because it's not like the terminator where they, where they repurpose them yeah, it's yeah. by choice yeah. they actually make the conscious decision and, yeah, to help humanity they, they come to io and they uh they leave their kind behind to join this um cooperative thing mm-hmm. that Again, it's humans and technology. Like we created the technology, we we need technology, and they started working so well together that like they're even naming the the new robots or AI or whatever that come to join the humans. They yeah. get personality traits. They get um, names. They uh, they're buddies. Like yeah. they they fist bump each other. Some of them felt like soulmates almost even. Like yeah. in when we get the plant scene, those two like really felt like they had an emotional connection and and props to those actors too for for yeah. portraying that so well cuz I really felt there was an emotional connection between yeah. those yeah. two. And yeah, and so the programs also from within the matrix or that are created by the machines, mm. they can now exist in the human world and become much closer to humans yeah which is like what morpheus is as well and like a it's almost like a nanobot kind of thing which is an interesting take on a very existential crisis yeah. kind of idea yeah. so it was really cool that i predicted that yeah I, like i, I loved that, that i was not it. expecting that at yeah, all yeah. i wasn't expecting you to be to write in that and you you nailed it yeah you yeah. nailed it I guess now in the story, after this self-referential b- intro, yeah, we find out that Neo, um, Neo gets freed yeah. from this by Bugs and some of the other humans, her crew. Yeah, and we see right off the bat that, and again, this kind of draws from the video game a little bit that Neo and Trinity's bodies were never recovered because yeah. they were repurposed and yeah. they were used by the yeah. machines, which is so poetic yeah yeah um, they, they they realized they couldn't destroy them and they had a immensely difficult tr- time yeah. figuring out how to repurpose them and in a, like in a positive way because it kept like these two souls are so connected yeah that if they touch they like blow everything up so they have to be kept like close enough together yep. that they are they feel safe but not so close that they feel like they can escape or something like that. Quick reference here, and this is something that the analyst says, is that it was it was very financially complicated mm-hmm. to do that and to get them to that point. And they didn't the machines didn't agree with him and didn't think it was going to be worth it when they were doing it. What's really interesting about that is that it's actually a little bit of a callback to the Animatrix. Because in the second Renaissance uh, short stories, 
they actually talk about how when O one the machine city goes off and does its own thing, what mm. they do is they make an economic powerhouse and they just output like the greatest in technology and they sell it to all of humanity. But what happens is is they're they're so economically minded that they tank the entire other world markets and that's yeah. why humanity actually they actually launched nukes on O one basically oh, and that starts okay. that starts the, the war. war again okay and so it's really interesting because that's kind of a callback to that that the machines even though they're machines and you would think that they have maybe a higher purpose they were still created by humans yeah. and they still have that economic mindset yeah, yeah. to them interesting so yeah after that we get i loved neo's awakening scene every every component of that meeting so like a smug a little bit different uh morpheus in yeah, the bathroom yeah, yeah. and and then getting that awakening of smith oh man that's that was maybe one of my top favorite scenes in the yeah, movie was and, the awakening of Smith. Yeah, and Keanu is still he or sorry, and Anderson, he's he he's still trying to he's still stuck on the idea that he's going insane because it's been so heavily conditioned in it's, him. It's almost a callback to the first movie and the humble beginnings yeah. of Thomas Anderson to becoming Neo. But, a little bit. That kind of fits and, his character. Yeah, yeah, they do the similar things yeah. where um they in this version, they text him to go to the uh, room at the end of the hall, and but in the first one, he's on the brand new type cell phone, like those right. are just new the technology. Nokia's. Yeah, Nokia's, <laughs> and he's told by Morpheus to go to the end of the hall, the room, and then um, he's still like, "What's going on?" And like, it's yeah, it's it's they rehashed that, yeah, but in a way that he is so. Well, he's, he's still been taking thinks, the blue pills, man. Yeah, yeah, he's taking I blue pills that. every I day. That yeah, too. that was unreal. So he was conditioned to take these blue pills because he was told by the analyst, who was just his therapist, yeah, that it was preventing his insane um, right. flashbacks or experiences, his episodes. Yeah, so then we break out and... We've got A, there's a lot happening even in that scene. There's a lot to digest. He's got machines who are taking him away, and we don't know that they're good machines at this point, which was yeah. a really great touch there. Yeah. Um, very minor, but I really like that. We also see the other pod across from him, and we instantly know that it's that's Trinity, Trinity yeah. but very interesting as well, and even that they've been segregated from everyone else, and the way that the machines hid their code within yeah. the Matrix for so long is so yeah. interesting, and that kind of plays back again to the blue pills as well, and making Neo not want to be found. Yeah, yeah, they keep him in a certain state of mind where he doesn't have the opportunity to start wanting to be found. He yeah. He's kept just perfectly hidden for these past 60 years. Yeah. And that just shows, again, the, like, the upgraded version of what this analyst is compared to the, the to, architect of before or... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or Colonel Sanders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I, the analyst is a whole another level compared to Colonel Sanders. I loved yeah. the analyst, whereas I th I think that Lana Wachowski learned a lot from the backlash of the architect. The architect at, yeah, because yeah. he wasn't really anything. Like, he was this big figure, but we didn't see anything from him. Even the explanations of yeah. the analyst were so much easier to understand and digest. And yeah. and again, that speaks to the accessibility of the Matrix Resurrections. I really think that it's more accessible than the second movie, even. Mm -hmm. But still less accessible than the original Matrix. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so after that, we get to go and see how humanity has kind of adapted over the last 60 years and the major changes that the machines have undertaken. And we're still kind of living in exile with with some connections to the machine world. And, and that's, again, there is even callbacks to the Matrix Online a little bit. They didn't take everything from the Matrix Online, and that's really important that that's not... I wouldn't say 
that the Matrix video games are canon. However, they used some ideas from it in in Resurrections, and I think overall they did a good job deciding what to keep yeah. and what not to keep. That's good, yeah. And one of those things is that of the destruction of Zion and the creation of IO. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we see Captain Niobe again. Yes, and we're reintroduced is, to Captain Niobe. And she is very different, and she's... Um, she's she matured. Back, yeah, she's matured, but she's also become pessimistic. And she was always pessimistic, but she fell back into that. But then she also still had that belief. It was just... It's yeah. been so long, and she'd been beat down in uh, the from the guise of leadership and she's also trying to protect her people right yeah. because at this point in time i don't know how many years they've been living in io but relatively peacefully in io and they're not shaking things up and we even hear that they've kind of started to give up on releasing people from the matrix a little bit because yeah. it's just not worth it at this point the the risk versus reward yeah for them it it just isn't there and they've been living relatively peacefully they've been even cultivating some strawberries and and other kind of yeah, things they, that would improve their quality of life compared to the old zion and yeah. and even kind of having to rebuild from any of those ashes of a potential war yeah yeah so i mean you can't fault the thought process no i think that was yeah well done going back to like plot i guess is yeah. that now we, the whole goal of the rest of the movie, I guess, is to save Trinity. Yeah. Of course. And um, the way they go about it is pretty cool. Like the, and this goes back to the choices and the, the choices become changed in a way from the beginning of this movie. Yeah. They, we see Morpheus gets to take the red pill. Yeah. From Bugs. That was cool. And Bugs did offer the red and the blue, but she said, like, I'll offer you both. But, but we're at we the both point know. already. Yeah. Once once I've shown you the pills, we already know what the answer yeah, you're is. You're gonna take the red because you're at that point. Yep. And so yeah, the the idea and the illusion of choice mm -hmm. is less clear and more clear. Like yeah. you don't have as much of the illusion. And, but you do, of course, have the choice. But we know, like you're, you're the choice has already been made. It's up yeah. to you to interpret. And the choices that you have made up till this point, yeah, are leading you down this path. So yeah, just take it. And then from there, uh, Morpheus he becomes like fully Morpheus, the yeah. new iteration, and he really goes into learning what it means to be Morpheus. And then when he offers uh, Neo the red pill he doesn't even offer the blue pill partially because he's like you've been taking those blue pills every day you're stuck in there because you're taking the blue pills yeah and i could offer you both but you need to take the red pill yeah and so that's a cool um change and very intelligent way to continue the pills like um choice mm -hmm. because yeah they just went into it in a very cool way yeah so, yeah, so we get the breakout of Trinity. Part of what I love about that, and this is a small callback to the second movie where the council asks all of the captains if any of them will go and on the rescue mission to save Neo, and we only get two volunteers and one very reluctant volunteer, and every captain steps up here yes. that was that was a touching moment yes and that was something yeah the, like they kind of missed earlier and they they nailed it there because yeah. everyone everyone has heard the legend of neo and yeah. all this stuff and they partially are um they they have all kept up that hope and it's all young crew members they're all young captains basically yeah. and they've lived on this legend of neo and the fact that he's the reason they have this version of peace and, but they also know that everything that Niobe does is for the good of them. She's protected them with everything. So then, yeah, the fact that they all stepped up with no hesitation was really cool. And we even see, again, it's a little bit more lore, how the actions and the events of the machine war have affected 
the people of IO 60 years later, there's, there's the legend, like you said, the legend of, of Neo. And there are people who consider themselves like Neo savants basically. And, and they, they study everything related to the one. Basically. Yeah, yeah, they're very obsessed with it, and they they basically created the study of neo neologists. Yeah. Neologists, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I guess one thing we when we get back into the Matrix for the first time, we have the face off between all of the exiled programs who have now been re added into the Matrix by Smith, yeah, as well as the return of one of our favorites, the Merovingian, yeah, and. Honestly, this is where I kind of wish they had subtitles in the theater because he was, he was, uh, he basically looked like he's been obviously homeless or like he's been roughing it for the past 60 yeah. years. He has been out in this, he's been exiled. Yeah. And so he's gone insane. He's not this well put together, suave, and like smooth person yeah. that he was in the, um, the second and third. Yeah, and he, he's even referencing that again. Yeah. I have very mixed feelings about the Merovingian in this. He he becomes a reference for the sake of a reference yeah, a little bit. Yeah, And They didn't do... They, they, they didn't underutilized do his character yeah, and yeah. him as an actor. Because you and I both really enjoyed the portrayal in yeah, the first two. Yeah. And this doesn't feel like a callback to it. Now, if there's any sequels to resurrections then we'll see if he plays a bigger part because he's free he's been released again yeah but if he is used in the future i think he's got to be a central villain i i don't want to see him again as a side plot and another side quest on the main path of the story i think that's been done so many times yeah, at this point yeah. to the merovingian that he's either got to be a main bad guy or let's just move on from him yeah like i don't know if they'll like flip it again where he... so this is a very interesting part about smith mm -hmm. is that he does help neo yes so and again this is him evolving yeah again so that's because... where i that's just to finish the merovingian thing yeah um that's the only other way that i could see it happening is that the merovingian has a similar growth but at the same time, other than either of I don't villain, think the Merovingian grows the same way as Smith. I think no, but he could grow in a very different way that could blow our minds. I don't know that that yeah. will happen. Maybe I I think that the Merovingian is too self serving, whereas well, Smith is all self serving now. He he is, but I think there's a difference there. I think that Smith can see when he can use other yeah, people yeah. whereas the merovingian sees things a little bit more linear uh, yeah a, a little bit more tunnel vision yeah on things yeah and he's been in in exile so he didn't have the time to grow the way that smith did yeah i thought smith's kind of his relationship with Neo was very well done again. Yes, in yes. And because you start to see some kind of respect and understanding in yeah. the third. And um like overall he continuously grows through from one to three. And then in this iteration of him, he's yeah, he's had a lot of time to really reflect mm -hmm. and things have changed in the Matrix and he's not He's, he doesn't have his central purpose anymore, yeah. and he really becomes, yeah, like a, a new character, a solid character, in like, growth-wise. Yeah. Jonathan Groff just really nailed his portrayal, yeah. Yeah. and I think a weaker actor would have made us regret the return of Smith. Yeah, yeah, especially, yeah, like... He, they he wasn't to, a letdown in any way. Yeah, they needed to go different. I think just having Hugo Weaving return would have maybe watered down the character's death a little bit. And again, it's a little bit of an updated portrayal of Smith, but he he adds a different kind of depth to Smith that I really enjoyed. I had a dumbass smirk on my face underneath yeah. the mask the every scene <laughs> that Smith was in. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, and that. every... He had a lot of great lines too. Yeah. Again. Yeah. Him and Morpheus again were 
again, it, it goes back to Morpheus and uh, Smith having some of the best lines in the movie. Yeah, I agree. They were throughout the whole Matrix series. Those two are the key to the the feelings. I think. Yeah. Like the um the whole experience is just like heavily balanced on those two, and they they kept it going. I think. Yeah, I. I honestly think I give it to Jonathan Gross portrayal Smith as my favorite portrayal in Resurrections. Like, there's so many... You can uh, honestly... If you argue anybody else, I'm fully on board with it. Like, if you argue, argue that Bugs was portrayed the best, I'm I'm there for you. If you think Morpheus, yeah, yeah, nailed it. Again, mm -hmm. fully on board. You, can, you could convince me of just about any character here because... I really don't see any bad portrayals. I I had a lot of fun. Yeah, like this. there was zero bad acting. Yeah. Um nothing that would take you out of the film. Yeah. And all the characters uh, are fairly well written too. Like yeah. I don't I can't think of any character that made me think, "Ah, this this doesn't fit mm. in this version of yeah. the Matrix." Yeah. They might not fit in the original trilogy, but where things are right now, really good yeah yeah they all fit in and like the the extra crew members there were two guys from sense eight do you remember okay. that show no i haven't watched it remember oh no okay <laughs> we've talked about uh, sense eight anyways yeah so um uh there were two characters from that that the two actors i was like i know these guys and they're really good they were the one guy um was it the one captain shepherd yes shepherd mm. Um, mm -hmm. that is uh max reimalt i believe mm -hmm. yep. and uh he's typically like german or russian yeah act, like he plays those characters and he, i think he is actually uh german anyways yeah he, like his dialogue and his scenes mm -hmm. were cool his character his visualization of himself in the matrix was cool yeah same with the uh other guy who was brian j smith and uh who did he play berg yeah berg he um he had some very funny lines. Yeah. And Honestly, this this is having side characters done right. Yeah. You can really contrast the difference between the Matrix Revolutions and the Matrix Resurrections here and see the difference. Because the, the side characters were meant to spice things up rather than take the the central stage yeah. at yeah. any point in time and each of them felt like their own person very much like yes. each had a character and actually there's a third sensate guy toby on mu on on woomir toby on woomir who played sequoia he um is also in sensate but he was a very good operator because he was partially in and out. That was an interesting. That was a cool. Change. Yeah, I like that. I yeah, like because that. he was like a um, ghost version of himself in the Matrix, along like to help Bugs and everyone mm -hmm. with the directions instead of just being on the phone. It was yeah. cool they inserted him. They grew the technology of the Matrix so yes. much that, it, and it felt so natural and real. It felt like in a that good period natural of time. progression. Yeah, yeah, like that's exactly what should have happened in the yeah. past twenty years. Yeah. Or 60 years. Basically, they figured out, like, nanobots. So, yeah, of yeah. course it's 60 years. That's fair. I... Okay, so we've talked a lot of favorite scenes here, and we've had a lot of fun so far. Quickly, we're getting to the scene, so we might as well bring up our, one of our least favorite scenes, or one of my least favorite scenes, is the train action scene. Is mm. is the quintessential scene that, that soured my taste on resurrections and what i kind of was referring to earlier with the effects and filming just the shaky cam everything's kind of semi happening outside of focus it's yeah. impossible to understand what's happening it's that's where it first kicks in yeah yeah that was that was really rough for me and that took me out of the matrix a little bit you want to be out of the matrix don't you? <laughs> or do you want to stay in anyways i'm a blue pill yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I very much agree, and that's where the the action started to build up because it was basically the second or third. It's probably beginning um, the second act. Second act, yeah, 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 yeah. They started all the action, and then we were just introduced to this new age action, close ups of faces, and then like quick cuts, quick yeah. cuts on quick cuts. It yeah. sucked. Yeah, like it. We we missed there were there were still like some throwback like little nods to the old fighting styles. Yeah. Where like we see Smith 
um, doing the like multiple quick punches against Neo yep. later, and because he did that to Morpheus, yeah, and to Neo, I want to say, but he, I can't remember for sure. But yeah, I don't he remember. did that. He like there, it's there a call, was still, it was a callback. Yeah, yeah, there were still like good parts of those scenes that we loved from, like that. That's what set the Matrix apart action wise was yeah. their fight scenes, and they dropped the ball. They really dropped the ball in that, and they dropped the camera. It seemed like, and it was just <laughs> tumbling time, around. And they just yeah. pick it up. They're yeah, just like, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. like they coated it in KY jelly or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, it feels like a Family Guy scene where the guy just can't like yeah, yeah. carry the thing. And he's yeah. like, blah, 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 blah. yeah, like, I don't it's know. covered in oil. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they yeah, it just didn't work. We were hoping that that wouldn't happen. Yeah, but it's almost expected. We should have known. We should have known with a blockbuster movie like this that we were going to get generic action more similar to what we've had in the last 20 years rather yeah. than the groundbreaking action. And let's quickly talk about Bullet Time and version 2 yes, Bullet Time. Yes, Bullet Time. So this is great. I actually love the idea and the purpose behind it is the analyst has has now observed bullet time and calling it for what it is yeah. as well and he's he's realized that if humanity can abuse that within the matrix why can't machines go another step further and program that to move even faster yeah. than bullet time honestly i think i thought of this previously i don't I didn't bring it up. I don't think I, I, I don't think I fully developed this thought until after we did our primer. Uh -huh. Like on my drive home after the primer, I was like, "Why isn't this happening?" Or maybe I thought of it during one of my watches. But anyways, mm -hmm. it makes so much sense that a computer should be able to be so much faster than human thought. It's like Inception almost at the same time, where like things slow down. Yeah. As you go deeper into deeper into dreams in the matrix you kind of are in a dream state so which is faster it's like in the first trilogy we were um the bullet time was created by the human mind yeah and then i was thinking back then that why don't the machines just like ramp up their speed in this right specific area they learned that the battery technology wasn't there yet. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Because <laughs> the CPU wasn't uh, doubling fast enough at that time. Yeah, because actually, it's a joke, but the analyst has... The reason why the analyst is in power now is because he's created the efficiency of batteries yes, in humans yeah. by utilizing the power of hopelessness yeah. and despair. Yeah, as they, as they are so similar in the human brain or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Because... And that's something that they really nailed is... That's something that Smith was missing in the first, uh -huh. and he knew it, and it was central to his character was that he didn't understand humans. Right, and so I the love analyst that call back to the yes. analyst again. The analyst versus Colonel Sanders. Yeah, yeah. The, the architect. Yes, the architect. <laughs> Is that rather than machines trying to understand humanity they just have some offset program yeah. like figuring it out for them it's not central to their plans they don't care yeah. but but the the analyst has realized the importance of understanding its food essentially yeah yeah which is and it's such a great yeah, concept and they nailed that aspect yeah. of it and that adds that adds so much good to this mm -hmm. this iteration so Stakes for me, uh, we've already talked about stakes enough here, but I guess what I'll quickly say about the stakes is I was really nervous for everyone in the final action scene where everyone's trying to get away. Mm. I I really didn't expect as many people to survive that final battle. The dropping of the bodies out oh of my the sky. God. That that was amazing. That was crazy. Absolutely amazing. You couldn't have done that in the early two thousands. No, no, hundred percent not. But the the way so uh, they used humans as bombs. Yeah. So uh, oh to, my to God. set up the scene so that everyone knows what we're talking about. Yeah. So the analyst is like almost at his. He's at his like win phase against uh, Neo, and then Neo is like. No, we're not doing this. He like him and Trinity connect and they sort something out, and then 
uh, the new version of Smith comes out and just like shoots the analyst, and so Smith saves the day basically for Trinity. Our, our and, IO yeah. operatives. Yeah, yeah. So there's a bunch of IO operatives in there against a bunch of the uh, analyst Smiths. Yep. Like the Smith we know, he saves the day just for a second, and then yeah. he said, "I did this like." just self-serving enough that it helped you yeah. like this this worked out for now yeah and this now truce has run its course yes yes <laughs> which was fantastic yeah yeah so he ends that and he he a new technology within the smiths is the uh swarm yeah. so the swarm is every single person in the matrix starts yeah. rushing it's the like it's central like characters fast zombies basically yeah. think fast zombies yeah yeah and then um they utilize so there were there were in downtown of this of the mega city the mega city that uh the matrix is in the cool thing is is that they didn't just do it randomly yeah. they showed a little bit of character in there yeah. with the first one you that see was wild. you see a couple's laying in bed and they're on like the 50th floor of this massive tower yeah they're in bed the guy wakes up, his eyes go a little bit different, like go black, and his wife wakes up, looks at him, he's like, What are you doing? Like, he, is everything okay? And then yeah. he just gets up and full on rushes the window, dives out, she Head, screams. Yeah. And then you follow him down. Yeah. As he's plummeting 50 floors, they're trying to drop these bodies onto, onto the, the main characters yeah. onto the and, cars uh, and the motorcycle the motorcycle chase because that actually does damage like oh, i don't want to yeah. get too morbid here no, but the yeah. human body when it hits terminal velocity 120 miles per hour yeah is kilometers, i don't know is incredible and it's dense but yeah, yeah so and you see the impact they're crushing cars oh they're, my god they're splattering and, on the and concrete. that's not unrealistic either like yeah. that y y don't from, from yeah. your experience <laughs> yeah no no, no. <laughs> like uh, no yeah. they did it very they did it very well yeah it, that was that was shocking in a way that we haven't ever and really that, seen before that's where they stepped up with this yeah. new age shit i agree like, that was I, unreal everybody in the theater was like like gas yeah, yeah yeah they were enraptured by yeah. this they're yeah. like it added so much to that end because up until this point i think everybody was disappointed by the fighting and the action yeah. and stuff this just like save the day. Yeah. In That's that going to be the scene that's remembered it for yes, action it wise yes. in this. Yeah. And like, I got an instant callback to, uh, what, what movie was that? The mist? No. Are you thinking the happening, the happening. which is an awful movie? <laughs> yes. People hate that movie. Yeah. But it, I, I agree. I thought the exact same yes. thing. And honestly, I, I think the happening was pretty good. <laughs> Don't say that. It wasn't that People bad. People are gonna stop listening to the podcast. <laughs> Jason's <laughs> opinion <laughs> isn't that real. <laughs> Don't it's only my them. opinion. It's not fully formed either. He's not entitled know. to it either. I've had some wine. Anyways, <laughs> um, but yes, though that scene was absolutely amazing, and it's it saved the action of the end of the movie i agree i agree it was one of the high points of the action for the film it, it was such a unique and well utilized idea mm -hmm. and it fit really well because we also see that the machines will go to any, any length. length to to further their cause because tiff triffany triffany <laughs> <laughs> that's a good mix yeah, yeah. so well we're not quite at uh, Trinity yet so Triffany everyone within the Matrix has a handler basically well Neo Smith and Trinity basically are three characters who are being utilized Watched. for their prior code essentially yeah, yeah. and Trinity her handlers are her what she thinks is her husband and her kids. Yeah. I was really hoping she would have to fight her kids off, oh. but they didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you imagine her kicking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I love that end scene where um she got she like punched the analyst in the chest and she's like yeah. that's for using kids, man. Like don't you don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was a, that was a cool little scene, that little end scene where she kicked off his jaw as reference to earlier when she said that's what she wanted to yeah. do. Yeah. Right. And um, uh, one one character that we didn't bring up is uh, Sati. Yeah. Were you about to? Were you thinking? No, that? I no? haven't. Yeah, I haven't brought her up. She 
like this is again what we got right is that uh she would eventually replace the oracle which is what she's done basically yeah yeah and in her own way she's not exactly like the oracle again but um she used her programming that we kind of had a hint of when she was a little kid yeah to and her relationship with her parents and and retroactively it makes the third movie storyline and her character's plot yes. more relevant which yeah, I enjoyed. because because it wasn't really explained we didn't understand her earlier mm-hmm. and they fixed that they remedied that so uh, yeah they they had a really good wrap up of bringing her in fully to yeah. the matrix yeah what are your thoughts on this movie as closure to the original trilogy versus maybe the start of something new would you be happy if this was the last matrix film with involving neo and trinity because uh, i mean we can never count out the studios reinventing especially an ip with this much value but if if this is how the matrix ended let's say they release a super cut of reloaded and revolutions so that this is actually the third movie ending the trilogy could you be happy with that or do you do you think that this film didn't conclude things properly or they or that it's it needs more story to tell the story of the matrix? I think we want a conclusion and I don't think this was it and I don't think the third was it. Mm-hmm. Obviously Neo dying in the third that left it open because we didn't see the bo- we knew that the body wasn't recovered basically at yeah. that point. And so that's why the third was so hated yeah. by everyone is that it didn't feel like a proper conclusion to the story. Mm-hmm. So does this this writing the wrongs of revolutions enough for you that you could walk away feeling happy or do you need more? I think I need more. I want more. I want more. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the that's the thing. It, it, it's almost like the the new look on choice. It's yeah. like is it a need or a want? Yeah. Because Everyone, like, the guy who uh, was upset as we were walking out of the theater, yeah. like, he he needed more, I think, but yeah. but then he wasn't happy with this, and I think, um, well, I think you should listen to our podcast, maybe you didn't catch everything we caught, <laughs> but I think we, I think we'll, we're gonna get more. I think there could be a natural conclusion, and again, I think it has to do with humanity and technology becoming one again Mm -hmm. because there's a this whole idea of singularity that i think has been expanded upon since the 90s that they can they can definitely go in that direction and just just bring it back to like a holistic it's like we we start to see it in this movie where there are no dogs but man's best friend is starting to look like technology again Mm -hmm. for the first time in a thousand years within the matrix or 200 years. I forget exactly how far we are from the war. Well, uh, several hundred years. Yeah. Several hundred. So yeah, like the idea that we could, we're, we need to explore that. So here's where I kind of land is if this was the last movie of the Neo and Trinity Matrix saga, I could be happy. I I could be happy with where it ended. I think the characters can go and live a happy life and conclude on a happier note. On the flip side, I would love to see more of the new Morpheus. I I need Mm. to see more of the new Smith. I need yes. his, I need yeah. to see where his character is going and what he's going to be up to now. Mm-hmm. I would I would really enjoy some more Bugs. I think that Bugs is a great character that yeah. can be utilized more in the future. And if we're going to bring back the Merovingian, he's got to be a main villain. He's yeah. he got to give him his his spotlight to do his thing, and I would like to see that as well. Yeah, like uh maybe like a fully insane program that is somehow out of the reach of others. I don't know where they could go with him, but anyways, yeah, I, I very much agree on your, on your points because yeah, it's the way you just broke it down in my opinion is that there's the story of Neo and Trinity Mm -hmm. that 
I feel I agree. It's it's concluded enough. They yeah. they've reached their harmony yeah. without any um downside. Like they they were dead last movie. Yeah. And um so they're basically they can go live a happy retired life or something like that. Yeah. And I like the way I imagine it, them flying off together is it's perfect. It's done. Yep. But the world has much left to explore. There's a lot of stories that have been left to tell here. Yeah. I think it would be a really cool film to ha- and and it's it feels a little bit like the torch being passed on maybe yeah. a little bit to New Morpheus and Bugs. Yeah. As well as to our new Smith and potentially like I said I really want to get the Merovingian as a main villain, but we'll see if that ever happens. What else was I going to say? Oh, just one kind of thought that I had through the movie that I really liked is the Smith Neo relationship was explored on a more uh, face value level. Like it's, it's really discussed more straightforward with the audience. And yeah. I liked that in the sense that it, it kind of felt like a and DC fan here, a Batman and Joker relationship. Like yeah, one can't yeah. exist without the other. Yeah, I would agree for the most part, except for the fact that you don't see the Batman and Joker facing one other character down, I don't believe. I don't know for sure, but like whereas we do see that with Smith, so it's a bit more in what way, sorry. So um in the way that Neo and Smith but we're both taking one person down together and then mm. the, they split again. Like the their paths took down merged. the entire Gotham crime syndicate. He burned all of their money to the ground. Yes, but like that wasn't together. That was... It wasn't together. It wasn't... Th- and like, like they weren't yeah. like... There was no like nod of respect and saying like i i could like the we can, Joker we can work Batman. together they do but it's in a it's in a more insane way yeah. this is yeah so okay i'll i'll allow it yeah All that's right. that's a, that's a <laughs> good points on that i can see where you're going and uh, yeah i can agree i think that's a not a knock but i i don't know what the opposite to that is it's getting late for me here but uh a ring. I think that's i think I'm that's a, s- <laughs> a knock on the door a ring i don't know no. what it's it it's a sign of good storytelling where the hero and villain feel very connected and, and yeah, intri- yeah. intrinsically 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 can- connected. connected. Is that the word? Is that In- what I'm looking for? Intrinsically, yeah. It's late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there anything you want to touch on at this point? I think I've got everything that I wanted to. My favorite scenes, my least favorite scene. Oh, quickly. Other scene that we even talked about on the walk out to the car was the convoluted mm. uh, plot points related to Sati releasing Trinity Into from bugs. her pod. Yeah, yeah and yeah. through bugs. And just quickly, my understanding is that we had trinity connected to her pod Mm -hmm. and then we had bugs connected beside her to the um the matrix Mm -hmm. through a portable connection and so we basically had the connection routed to trinity and then had her disconnect from her connection through the pod so that we never broke the connection because we didn't have time for her to be properly released from the matrix yeah and that i think is the best way that i can explain it but i think i could be missing some finer points there yeah i feel like at like within the week we're gonna see a good um theoretical explanation of that because it's like it's it's like, did they use it, bugs as like a USB or a hard drive, or was it some other like technological explanation? There might be one. I think other than that, that, it was too connection. convoluted. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a little too convoluted for um. A, and things were moving really watch. quickly at this yeah, point, yeah. and it, it was hard to follow along with that. In addition to all the other moving. Yeah, parts. so I don't know if it was necessary. It, and like it might have been just for the um like 
the technological or like people would have picked it apart if they didn't do that probably but they're gonna pick it apart now anyways so was it necessary we'll we'll find out all right well i think that's a great spot to kind of end on then that's it for us for 2021 which is a a great start banner year for the podcast oh yeah i'm I'm really excited with where we've gone and where we're going yeah and i think ending it with the matrix was pretty fun especially it's like the last it's the last big ass movie of the year yeah so we had a yeah we had a great time starting this I, we could keep talking about this for like hours. It's hard to keep the times down. Yeah. So like, sorry to any of our listeners if we're if some of our episodes are too long. We're we're trying to learn how to best do the format properly and yeah. do it justice for what we want to talk about. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, at the end of the day, honestly, my favorite podcasts are the longer ones because I can just let them play yeah. and I don't. I understand that I don't have to listen to them all at one go, right? Like some podcasts are two hours and I'll listen to them over like three, four sittings. And, and I actually prefer that over having to curate a list of 15 minute podcasts. No. Yeah. I definitely agree on a longer drive. I hate when, um, like I've queued up one or two and then I happen to be driving for an extra hour and I'm like, some random episodes going to pop up and like, I might not even care about this. Yeah. Yeah. exactly but, yeah so but anyway i'm excited i'm excited where things are going yeah. do you want to announce what the next movie is going to the new year do i know yes <laughs> we're, should i know should i remember at this point i don't yes you, because you, you were very excited about it i'm excited about a lot of things man <laughs> we're doing soylent green oh yeah the movie that's exciting that takes place in 2022 oh that's sick that's yeah. that's really i didn't know that that's pretty fun yeah so yeah there's uh everyone's heard about soylent green but has anyone watched it no i no. haven't as a side note i watched the original spartacus that came out in 1960 and i really enjoyed it and it felt like an old movie but the the material that it was covering really fit with the time period, and I highly recommend you watching it. I'm, I'm definitely re- going to. I really yeah. want to hear your thoughts on it. So, Anyways, great year, great intro to a podcast. Uh, we've been having a lot of fun, and we'll keep having fun. And we hope you're along for the ride with us. So yeah, definitely. We- happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, happy holidays, and we'll see you in the new year, 2022. Can't be, I'm already, I'm going to say it now. Can't be worse than 2021, right? (laughs) Uh, We'll see. We got a podcast now. (laughs) Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. (laughs) If we survive the year. (laughs) I'm not even going to knock on wood. We're all going to die. See you around everyone. All right. Have a good one. (laughs) See you in hell audience.